I'm saying to Muslims, praise God. But sit down on your behind after you pray, that prayer is no good. Because there's got to be an action that come behind prayer to cement the validity of your crying out to God. If you pray and don't work, then the prayer means nothing. And if it's just religion to make us holy, but not to make us free, I don't want to be no damn holy slave. I want to be a holy free man. And therefore, if religion don't make me kill my oppressor, if he won't get the hell out the way of my freedom, if religion won't sanctify me in the holy effort of fighting like hell with every ounce of power that I have for my liberation, then goddamn religion. But I know that the prophets of God were liberators. And I know that they fought for the freedom of their people, so true religion is always on the side of the oppressed against the oppressor. I'm finished. I became the national spokesman for Elijah Muhammad. Went right up into Malcolm's place. I didn't want Malcolm's place. I loved it. I loved him, and I wanted for him what was his, and I wanted to aid him in any way I could to maintain what was his, and here was I in Malcolm's house. Here was I over Malcolm's temple, or the temple that Malcolm was over. Here was I in the city that honored Malcolm, New York, and then my trouble <coughs> began. Because the same jealousy that twisted and hurt Malcolm was now directed at Brother Fosco. The more I became popular, the more intense was the envy and the vicious talk about this brother among my peers. There wasn't a city that I went into that I didn't hear what my brothers were saying against me, about me, while I worked 18 hours a day for the cause of Islam and denied my wife and my children a father for a cause that I believe in. And so Malcolm's enemies did become mine. But here's where Brother Farrakhan made a mistake. I succumbed to a seed. And I too began to foolishly think, and I wonder, is my teacher jealous of me? Why are you saying this, Farrakhan? They say confession is good for the soul. But you see, when you tell the truth, you help somebody else to see truth, even if the truth is against yourself. I loved my leader and teacher, but I had a weak thought that came because my leader was so far seeing. He looked at me one day at the table when everybody was praising Farrakhan. He hit the table and said, hmm, yes, he's very well known, all right. So that when he turns hypocrite on me, the whole world will see him. hit me like a, say, well, what is this? What, what did he say this for? But he saw way down the line, even as Jesus saw Peter, boy. He knew I was going to deny him. He saw it. And he prayed for me. And he told me that I would return only because his prayers were found worthy in the sight of Allah. I'm finished now. Up to two months before he left us, around the table were all of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's major ministers. And it was brought up because Elijah Muhammad said, and it was 
well known in the nation that one would rise that would make Malcolm's opposition to the messenger look like child's play. And everybody was focusing on me. And I was catching hell from one end of this country to another, but I never paid it no attention. When people spoke evil of me, I doubled the good that I would do. And the messenger said to me one day, he said, Brother, brother, they speak awful things about you, brother, but you something like myself. You don't pay no attention to it. You keep on doing good. Finally, I begin to break. And I decided I would come to Chicago and gather all the national laborers around and have it out. You see the Muhammad Speak newspaper? When Malcolm was doing great things for the nation, the New York Times would report it, the Chicago Tribune would report it, but the paper, his own paper, his national newspaper, wouldn't have nothing to say about it. I begin to see the same pattern develop with me. I said, oh man, what is this? And you can see how a seed is developing. So now I get ready to fight at the messenger's table. I never will forget it. All the national labors around, I'm bringing it up about envy and jealousy and how it destroys from within. And the messenger knew what I was getting ready to get into. He hit the table with his hand, boom, and said, brother, seek refuge in Allah from the envier when he envies. And he got up and he walked out of the room, blew my whole thing. I was ready to fight. He took the fight out of me. Then five minutes later, he came back and these are the words that he said. He said, brother, when you're getting ready to put a piece of board in the corner of the building to uphold the weight of the building, you have to put stress on it. And if it weakens under that stress, you know it's not the board you were looking for, so you throw it away and you get another. I didn't understand what he meant until approximately one year ago. Now I've walked in Malcolm's shoes. You don't have to tell me no more about where his feet went. I walked there now. Because when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad left here in 1975, I knew what he had said concerning Farrakhan and the role I was to play. But I could not play games with the destiny of a nation because I didn't know what the next step was. So when Imam Wallace D. Muhammad said he knew what the next step was, what was there for me to do but to submit and follow? And God is my judge. That's exactly what I did. I followed and I tried to walk behind this. But the more I walked behind it, I saw I couldn't build a bridge between the father and the son because they were going in opposite directions. So I had to make a decision. Which one shall I follow? Shall I follow the father or shall I follow the son? And I can't be no damn hypocrite to nobody. What I believe is what I believe. And I believe Elijah Muhammad was and is the messenger of God, not an imposter. I believe that he met with God. And I believe that what he taught is directly from God. So I made my decision to walk with the Father. And those that say it's a power play between Farrakhan and Muhammad, that's a lie. Don't use me as a scapegoat. The problem is between a son and his father. That's where the problem is. And I choose to take the father's position because that's a tried and tested position over 44 years. And I won't back down from that. I will die on that position because I know that position is correct and will bring the liberation of our people. So now... I was face to face with Malcolm's history. What do I do? Shall I split the ranks of the Muslims? I know you're tired, sister. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to keep you so long. I know you all are tired. 
I know you're tired, but I may never get a chance to see you again. I don't know when we'll meet again. But you know how you go get the disco all night long? I understand. You know how you freak your dick all night long? You know how you drink and party and get funky all night long? Well, damn it, stay here with me a few more minutes and let's get our heads together. I'm not going to take no more time, but I want you to know I'm alive today because Malcolm died that I might live. I understand history a little bit better now. He walked into something. The poor man, after he left the nation, he was not permitted to get to himself and to be quiet and to think and reflect. People were always on him. He was always in the press trying to develop his new idea, his new direction. He needed to go away, be quiet, think, reflect, and revive himself. Because when your faith is shaken in a man that was the central figure of your life, then all that man's teaching don't make sense no more. Then you're confused. You've got to get out of the light for a while and find yourself. And I wouldn't know how that felt until it happened to me and I became so confused. I didn't know whether what I was saying for 20 years was right or wrong. I walked the streets wondering, have I lied to people? Have I deceived people? Is this right or is this wrong? And finally, in the darkness, Allah brought me back to my senses. And I decided that I would stand for the messenger. But now that is his son. Whether he agrees with his father or not, that's between God, the son, and the father. That's, right. that's the father's blood running in the son's veins. That's right. Should I misuse my mouth and cause any harm to someone in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's family? I can't do that. Because if I love the father, even if I disagree with the son, I don't want to see no harm come to the son. You understand? So I withdrew from the public. You don't hear me on no radio. You don't see me on no television. If you hear me on the radio, it's a controlled speech. I don't take interviews. I don't want no television camera. People magazine want to do a story. I said, go get some other people. <laughs> New York Times wanted to do a feature article on Farrakhan. I said, no, thank you. Because I have grown up now. My father has taught me well. I don't need that crap. I don't need to be seen of men. I need to just get on with the work of my father, the work of building up a nation for the black man. Listen here, brother and sister. I will not go on no radio. No black reporter has been able to interview me. No white one, certainly, and no black one, never. Not until the storm is over. Why won't you come on? Because I know you. I know how you've been trained. All you want is conflict, controversy, bloodshed, war. That's what Western news is built on, disaster. I will not add to your desire to seek filth and put black man against black man. I won't do that. And so no matter what my Muslim brothers say against me, and they say much, I keep my mouth shut. And I will let you talk on until you talk your damn self out. And I will be here to remind you of what you said. I want you to know that you're not going to get rid of this one. You can try all you want to. By the help of God, I will be here. When the dust is cleared, I guess it's always in Shalom. And I believe that Allah will protect me as he protected my teacher before me. And I have that assurance from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, in fact, two of us is backing you up, brother. 
So I'm saying to you, my beloved brothers and sisters, I hear that foul talk following me all over the country. He's a hypocrite. He's only in this for money. You think I'm crazy? I could do a lot of things for money. I don't have to do this. Put my life on the line for money. Don't the scripture tell you that all that a man has will he give for his life? I want to live as much as any other man. But I want to see the black man live and his life is more important than my life and your individual life and millions of lives. If it's necessary, we will have millions to carry on. So my beloved brothers and sisters, there can be a harmony here. There can be a bridge built here. That as we move toward the 1980s, I salute Malcolm for the great work that he did. I salute him for the care that he took of me and the, the love that he showed me in teaching me and helping me. I don't know why history works this way, but if he had to be an example for me, I know that I could have never had this experience if Malcolm hadn't walked in front of me and showed me the way that I should go in order to escape what he ran into. So I'm alive now by God's grace, and I shall not forget those who taught me and shaped me, and formed me and developed me. And now I'm going on with this work. Malcolm was not moved by a ritual in Mecca to make him think that white folks in this sociological setting were changed. And ain't none of us that made the pilgrimage to Mecca who saw black, brown, red, yellow, and white for 14 days live like brothers. None of us can be deceived because after the ritual is over, everybody goes back to their nation and their customs. And I'm telling you, a nigga ain't nothing nowhere in the world, not in Mecca, not in Jerusalem, no holy city. And when I saw that with my heart, felt it, said, I'm coming on home, and we're going to stop all this divisive, foolish talk. And we're going to lock hands and put our brains in front of us. Let our brains go to the head and direct our hands. But we've got to stop begging and stop marching. Don't organize black people to march. Organize them to build. And we can make it through the 1980s. Oh, black man, if you think that white folks are your friends, then wait. Because right. he's going to put something on you and me in the next few years that he's going to make every one of you call for his destruction. He's going to make you pray for it. Because he don't love you. He's tired of you, brother and sister. He has no more work for you to do, no place for you to go. He hates your babies. Yeah. Because now your babies are twice as many as his. And he sees now that the birth control pill ain't stopping our reproduction. So now that man is angry, brother, because 10 years from now he sees that the war machine and the working machine will be predominantly black. And all white folks will be getting older and older because their birth rate is getting weaker and weaker. And you will be in a position to take over if you're strong. And so he don't intend for you to reach that era. So he's feeding you them reapers. <laughs> and he's dusting them reapers with PCT. Oh. He's killing you night and day. Yeah, Do you hear me, brother and sister? That man is killing you and you don't even know you died. You just as dead as hell. You can't build. You can't think. This is all you want to do, huh? This is you. Head full of nothing and you're behind swing. <laughs> baby, get down. Come on, baby, get down. Come on, baby, get down. Hell no. Come on, baby, get up. Yeah. You've been down all the days of your life. Get up. 
don't you go in no damn disco with that disorienting music telling you let's freak, freaky deep, programming you to accept freakish behavior when 20 years ago a faggot had to hide when he come among us. I'm accountable to you. And until you learn to make your leaders accountable, until you learn to make your professors accountable, until you may you learn to make your teachers accountable. And if they mess up, then you've got to deal with it. Let me tell you something. When everybody knows that they will pay a price and the price is death. And ain't nobody going to play with you no more. There ain't no leader going to bullshit you no more. Excuse that language. But when he knows that death is the answer and you must answer, then he'll be all right. He'll teach for you and not for the white man. He'll lead for you and not for the white man. And when you send him to Washington, he'll come back doing your will. But I want to warn you, what's good for the goose is also going to be good for the gander. Because we're not going to tolerate you making whores out of our women. We're not going to tolerate no pimping, brother. You've got to find you another gig. You're not going to hustle this black woman no more. And if you can take 13 whores and put them on the block, we're going to get a supermarket and run these Arabs that are selling more pork and more whiskey to our people out of our damn community. And we'll put you in the supermarket. And if you can make 13 whores jingle some money for you, then you can make them 13 cash registers jingle for us. And if you won't work, and you in trouble. I like Ayatollah Khomeini. I like what he's doing. You steal, you may lose your hand. When you lose that hand, when we see you walking with a nub, everybody know what you've been into. And you won't get into that no more. So brothers and sisters, this is an age of accountability. I'm leaving you now. All these young people, they're not like us. Our generation was faith and hope. Their generation is a generation of fulfillment. They're going to get what we wanted because they're willing to pay the price and make the sacrifice. And you and I must be there with us. We must do in this generation so that these little babies that were in here crying tonight won't have to take the burden on their shoulders. Let us shoulder our responsibility. Let us learn to love each other. Let us learn to be kind and forbearing and forgiving to one another. We've done it with white folks. Now let's do it for one another. Let me tell you something. If you and I would practice half the love for one another that we have given to the white man, we'd have enough love to go all the way to heaven and then come back and go back again. So brothers and sisters, I thank you for listening. I thank this committee who honored Malcolm X 
for inviting me, a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, to share this night of honor with him and with you. I hope you heard what I said, took it in the spirit in which I offered it. And I pray, God, that we don't make the mistake in the 80s that we made in the 60s to produce the disaster of destruction of our own business. May God bless you and keep you and guide you and protect you as I greet you in peace. That's all I'm going to say. Hold your seat, please. Hold your seat. Please take your seats, please. We have a couple announcements. Please, please, just another moment. We'd like to ask every one of you to please, as you leave, to purchase a copy of... Had a purpose for our coming together this evening. When we honor our black shining prince, we are demonstrating to our actions that we appreciate his sacrifice. On the 26th of May, next Saturday, those of us who have listened to Minister Farrakhan and have understood the wisdom that he attempted to impart will have an opportunity to display a part of what we have learned. Minister Farrakhan said, building a character sustains what you know. We are going to demonstrate our commitment to the liberation of our people by assembling at 8 o'clock on the corner of Austin Boulevard and Madison Street. And we're going to come down Madison Street into Garfield Park where we are going to address ourselves to some of the problems that our black people have not only here in this city, throughout this country and abroad. We call it African Liberation Day. We expect to see you 